Let's take a look at blood flow and blood pressure. Now let's think about the blood flow that you can see in different blood vessels of the body. There's basically two different types, a laminar and a turbulent. Now you won't see very much laminar blood flow. The only places you see this are in nice, straight, long, streamlined blood vessels. We don't have too many of those in the body, but think about a good one like the descending aorta. Descending aorta goes from up in the thoracic cavity down to around L2 in the lumbar region. So it's pretty broad, pretty large in diameter, and pretty straight. Here you'll see some nice, straight, streamlined blood flow, but don't think of all that blood as moving at the same speed inside that artery. The blood which is closest to the wall, which of course the wall is stationary, that blood's a little bit slower. Since it's colliding with that stationary wall, it makes sense that it would slow it down. And you can think of the blood flow deep to it towards the very center of this artery as going faster. It's like there's one ring inside of another where each ring closer to the center is moving a little bit faster. If you ever get out along the banks of a river, you can definitely see that the water in the center is moving quicker than what that is closest to the banks. That's the general idea. But something you will see in many different regions of the body is a turbulent flow. Now, this occurs in many different blood vessels, anywhere you have constrictions. Remember, as arteries go away from the heart, they get smaller in diameter, so they're going to slowly constrict. All those blood cells are going to come closer together and collide, and that's going to slow them down. There's lots of turns. It's definitely going to cause cells to collide with the wall and slow them. And also anywhere there's a rough surface, a lot of that inside the heart there. But let's look a bit at blood pressure here. Think about what you're looking at when you look at blood pressure. You're measuring how much force is pushing out on the inner wall of a blood vessel. That's what you use that blood pressure cuff, that sphygmo manometer for right there. Now, one thing about blood movement, what makes blood move is what's called a pressure gradient. You've got a gradient of something. You've got two areas that are different. So if you got a pressure gradient, it means you got two areas of different pressure. And if they're different, obviously one has to be higher than the other. So blood's only going to move from an area of high to low pressure. If the pressure wasn't higher at the heart, said that left ventricle, and lower everywhere else in the body, you'd never move the blood. So you got to have that pressure gradient. And usually when you talk about measuring somebody's blood pressure, you usually do it in the left brachial artery. Somebody just decided at some point that's the artery that we would use, and that's what's been used ever since. You definitely don't want to use a vein. They're going to have very low pressure inside of those. It'd be very, very difficult to do to start with. You'd need a special device, and you're not going to see changes in pressures. But in arteries, you will. So think about what you do with this blood pressure cuff. Put it around somebody's left brachial artery and attach that Velcro to keep it in place. You close that valve and pump that bulb and you can feel it squeezing on your upper arm. Well, that's going to put enough squeeze and pressure that it stops blood flow through that artery. So you stop that flow. You slide that stethoscope up under that cuff and push down with two fingers. Don't use your thumb, but two fingers. And when you press down, you start to slowly let off the pressure in that cuff. As you watch that needle drop and it gets lower, Eventually, you're going to hear the return of blood through that artery. When the pressure on the inside of that artery is greater than the pressure of the cuff squeezing, that's when blood flow is going to return. That's when you look at your gauge and get your first number. That's what's called the systolic, because systole is when those ventricles are contracting. When they contract and shove blood into the arteries, that's when pressure is at its highest. So that's why your first number is always the higher of the two. So you've heard that blood first squeeze through that artery. There's your first number, the systolic. You keep listening until the sound changes. People describe it in different ways. They'll say it lessens or the tone gets a little deep or whatever. That's when that artery is no longer constricted. That's when it's nice and wide and open, just like it usually is. And that change of tone you'll hear with a little practice. But that's when you look at the needle and get your second number, the diastolic. That's the least amount of pressure in that artery. And that will be found when the left ventricle is relaxing. So there's your greatest pressure in the artery and the least. Pressure when the ventricle is contracting, pressure when it's relaxing. Now, again, don't think that reflects the pressure in all arteries or the heart either. Remember, 
pressure has to be higher in any artery closer to the heart and lower as you go further away from it. So it's only the pressure in that one single artery. And these sounds that you're listening for <clears throat> with that stethoscope are what's called the carotid cough sounds. Now, why do you care what your blood pressure is? Because the higher the pressure is in your arteries, the higher it has to be at your heart. That means your heart has to work harder. And if it ever gets to where it's using up its oxygen supply quicker than what you can deliver more to it, that's when somebody has a heart attack right there, when they run into what's called oxygen death. But look also at blood flow. We had calculated in a previous video that if you want to know how much blood your heart's pumping in a minute, and that's what cardiac output is, you only need to know two variables, beats per minute and then stroke volume, which is how much blood was pumped with each contraction. So if you know how many times your heart beats in a minute and how much blood it pumps each time, that tells you minute volume, cardiac output. We calculated that as five liters per minute. But look at this basic flow equation. The top part tells you what causes blood to move, a pressure gradient, as we just mentioned, moving from high to low pressure. But you got to look at this big R, which is the resistance, right? What's slowing the blood flow down? We'll look at that in just a second. But with greater pressure differences, right, the bigger the difference in pressure in two areas, the greater the flow. And with greater resistance slowing and holding it back, there'll be less flow. So look at our resistance equation here, 8VL over pi r to the fourth power. Now, we won't know, worry about the number 8. That's a constant. And of course, that's not ever going to change. V is viscosity. When you change the viscosity of the blood, you're talking about changing how thick it is. Thicker things have more resistance to flow. It's going to be harder to push them. So anytime you get an increase in viscosity of blood, there's going to be more resistance. And that means there's going to be less flow. Just the opposite would apply too. If you decrease the viscosity, and of course there's less resistance and more flow either way. And the greatest way that you change the viscosity of your blood is by doing two things, changing the number of red blood cells or by changing the quantity of water. Now think about if you were to increase the number, say the percent of red blood cells in the blood, which is what's called hematocrit, that would make it thicker. If you were to lose water, that would make it thicker. But you could also look at the opposite too. Fewer red blood cells, or more water would make it thinner, lessening viscosity. So again, the thicker the blood is, the less it's going to flow. Makes sense. But then if you look over here to the other side, I guess we can mention the L, the length. We don't really look at that much, but longer blood vessels have more resistance, but texts usually don't get into that much. Everybody knows the pi is 3.14. We're not going to worry about that. But the little r is radius. Think about the size of the blood vessel. In that radius, distance from the center to the outer side. Uh, we've all seen that in other classes before. But look at this radius. Anytime you decrease the radius, you're making the pipe smaller. That's going to give you a very big increase in resistance because you're taking that change in radius to the fourth power. So any decrease in radius rapidly gives much more resistance and a whole lot less flow. And just the opposite would apply too. So changes in viscosity definitely affect resistance and flow, but changes in radius are much more important. And again, if you look at some of these major arteries, say we've got the ascending aorta right here. Come up the ascending aorta, there's the aortic arch. Well, first thing off the arch is the brachiocephalic artery. Comes out and becomes the right subclavian, then right axillary, right brachial. Then you've got your radial, and your ulnar arteries, palmar in the palm of the hand and digital in the fingers. But if we went on through this aortic arch and continued down, we'd have the descending aorta, which has a thoracic and then an abdominal section, splits into common iliac to external iliac to femoral and deep femoral. Then behind the knee, you'd have popliteal. <clears throat> Lateral in your leg, you'd have the fibular. And then medial to the inside, you'd have your anterior and posterior tibial, dorsalis pedis down in your foot, and digital in your toes. And there's a look at the circulation and again the links to the text.